I think technology can address some of the problems we come across in the world, create a more efficient way of doing things, and also a safer way. I think robots play a big part in that. So we have these blocks. Where would I go if I want to tell Root to draw? Shivana, do you remember? Oh yeah, I think it's in commands. Exactly. Humans are innately curious and they want to figure out how the world works around them or how to solve a problem. I think robots are on that continuum of innovation. There are just so many different forms and shapes that robots can take. They can help in almost any industry. So the AD Make Peace Company was started in the mid-1800s. It quickly became the largest cranberry company in the world and we're still the largest cranberry company in the world today. We make parts for medical, aerospace, military, automotive. The previous process that we had, it was like being glued to that machine for eight hours to make a certain amount of parts. I'll eat these all day long. Normally we'd have to walk out there, grab a square foot of vine, count your blossoms, kind of get an idea of what your crop is going to be. To have the drones be able to do that, that's all automatic. Being able to look at damaged spots, being able to watch temperatures, being able to watch moisture, all those things will make it easier to get your job done. With the robotic machine, it gives me that time back to do something that's more productive for me or more productive for the company. A robot is an extension of human capability whether it's extending the capability to be more efficient, to measure things in uh, more precise manners, or extending the capability to explore the world. So I want to thank Mass uh, Tech Collaborative for creating that video, um, it, which really highlights a lot of the different opportunities and companies that we have here in Massachusetts that are doing robotics. And in all of these opportunities, all of these companies, they need talented students to become our next generation of robotics experts um, to drive the research and the innovation. To get us started in this series, I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Leshen. Welcome, Dr. Leshen. Um, we're excited to have you here and tell you a little bit about your background and how you got into robotics. Um, I have a ton of questions, but rather than me asking them, I thought it'd be really cool to have a high school student um, really share that, his interests and his uh, uh, questions. Um, we'll also take questions from the audience. If you uh, look on the right-hand side of your panel, there is a, a tab that says questions. If you go in there and type in a question, if we have time, we'll, we'll add that to the list that I know Gladson uh, has. Um, I'd like to introduce Gladson. He is a uh, Boston Public School student, and he'll be, uh, he'll be interviewing Dr. Leshen today. Gladson, why don't you take it away? Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Gladson Pyres, and I'm a rising senior at the Dearborn STEM Academy. And today, we have a very special guest here with us, Dr. Leshen. How are you today? Hey, I'm doing great. It's nice to see you, and uh, thanks to everybody for coming. Thank you, guys. So I'm going to start off by asking the first question. So tell us how you decided to get into, into the technology realm, and was there something that inspired you from your childhood or any people who influenced you? Yes. Oh my gosh. Uh, thanks. Yeah, I could probably spend the whole hour just talking about that, but I won't. Um, yeah, my uh, my real inspiration, my background is I'm, I'm actually a scientist. I'm a space scientist. I study Mars and meteorites and cool space stuff. Um, and I was actually inspired to do that um, as a 10-year-old girl when I saw the first pictures from the surface of Mars. Uh, this beautiful kind of red desert landscape. I grew up in Arizona, so I think for me that landscape kind of looked like home. And I just remember looking at the pictures from the surface of Mars in a magazine 
and just wanting to reach out and touch those rocks and asking myself, well, how did we do this? How did we get pictures from the surface of another planet? And it turns out it's because we sent a, a robot there, a robot by the name of Viking, uh, which in the mid seventies took our first pictures from the surface of Mars. So for me, that was really the spark that lighted my interest in space. And then later I was very inspired by Sally Ride, who is the first American woman to fly in space. She flew on the space shuttle in 1983 when I was in college and, uh, and uh, it was uh, or right before I went to college, when she was uh, a true inspiration to me. And I'm, I'm happy to say that later in, in my life and hers, we got to know each other and became friends. She really was truly an inspirational person. Thank you so much. Um, where did you go to school and how did you decide to study as your major? So as I said, I grew up in Arizona. I actually kind of grew up on my local college campus, um, which for me was Arizona State University in Tempe, Arizona. It's now one of the, if not the largest, maybe the second largest university in the country. It's enormous, it's ex exciting, very big. Uh, and my mom actually went back to school when I was a young kid there, and then she started working there, and then I got a job there when I was 16, so I'm basically a college brat. I, uh, I grew up on college campuses. Uh, and again, from the time of being a kid, I was always really interested in science, and so I knew I wanted to major in science, but honestly, when I started college, I had no idea what I actually really wanted to major in. I was also interested in writing and journalism. I was the editor of my high school yearbook. So I had a lot of different interests, but a fabulous first year chemistry professor got me really, really excited about studying chemistry. So I declared that as my major. And then as I learned more about the fact that I could combine my passion for space with my scientific studies, I realized that most people that study other planets in our solar system are geologists. So in grad school, I kind of switched over and combined those two things, chemistry and geology, um, uh, so that I could continue my studies of space rocks. And actually my, my interest in geology goes back a long way too. I remember when I was about 10, my dad took us to the Grand Canyon. We lived in Arizona. By the way, if you haven't been there, audience, you should all go there, it's amazing big giant hole in the ground, amazing, amazing layers of rocks, great geology. And uh, and there was, a, I remember turning around and seeing there was a sign behind us that said, please don't take rocks from the Grand Canyon. Like, you know, it's a national park and stuff, you're not supposed to. And my dad said, see, that's how the Grand Canyon formed. Everyone came, took a rock and there you go. And I remember even then thinking, I, I don't think that's right. I was like nine years old or something. I don't think that's right. I'm making my first scientific hypothesis that this is not the way the Grand Canyon formed. And so my interest in rocks goes back a long way too. Thank you so much, that's so interesting. So <laughs> what was your first job after you graduated? So I'm kind of an academic by background. As you heard, I, I grew up on college campuses and, and I, um, for a lot, a lot of my career, um, have worked uh, at colleges. And so my first job after, I, so I went straight from my undergraduate degree to graduate school. I went to grad school at Caltech in Pasadena, California. Very, went from a really huge school to a really tiny school um, that was very focused on science and technology and uh, had a great experience there. And then after I graduated with my doctorate, I got um, I got a job at UCLA working in a lab on a giant machine that um, would actually blast tiny little holes in rocks and analyze the atoms that came out of them. And so I was working at UCLA on this in this very cool lab, and pretty and pretty quickly there I got involved in building robots to go to Mars myself. That's so cool. So mm -hmm. I see here that you worked at NASA, and which is super duper cool. Um, what was that like? What types of project did you work on? Yeah, I did work at NASA. So, you know, I was in, acad in the academic world for a long time. After UCLA, I went back to Arizona State and got a job as a professor there. And it was amazing and had my own lab and all that stuff. But then NASA came calling and, and it was just too interesting to pass up. So I, I worked at NASA for six years in several different roles where I was sort of overseeing large groups of scientists who were, so I worked, um, so you know that NASA has lots of different locations around the country, right? So there's the one in Florida where they launch the rockets and there's one in Houston where they control the rockets. You know, Houston, we have a problem. That's where mission control is. Um, the scientific parts of NASA 
are typically either at the Jet Propulsion Lab in California, which builds a lot of the cool robots that go into space, or at um, Goddard Space Flight Center in Maryland, named for Robert Goddard, who I will just point out graduated from WPI, who invented modern rockets about 100 years ago. And, uh, and so Goddard Space Flight Center in Maryland is where I worked initially, and I oversaw all the science programs there. So all the scientists that worked on the Hubble telescope and a lot of our Earth science missions that are studying climate change, understanding how our polar caps are changing, how our atmosphere and oceans are changing, worked for me at, at Goddard. Um, and while I was there, I got to be involved in, in building uh, Mars robots. So Joyce, I don't know if you can throw those couple of slides up there. Maybe I'll just say a little bit about the robots that I was involved in building while I was working with NASA. One of them, this first one, um, actually I worked on starting back when I was at UCLA because a lot of people at universities end up helping us build Mars missions and other kinds of space missions too. This is a mission called the Mars Polar Lander, which was the first mission designed to go land at the poles of Mars. And the reason that you're just seeing a beautiful painting of it rather than a picture of the whole thing is that it actually crashed. So it, it did not successfully land on the surface of Mars. We all know that technology is a real challenge. It, technology is hard and landing on other planets is really, really hard. And, um, and a significant number of the missions that we've sent to Mars in the history of humanity have not succeeded. And unfortunately, this was one. So it turned out I was on live television like with the countdown of when it was gonna land and waiting for the signal to jump up and down and silence, total silence. So there was a problem with the software, actually, the robotic software, as we uh, were descending and the engine shut off way too early and um, it crashed into the surface. And that was a real heartbreak because look at the beauty and complexity of, of that robot, it's, it's incredible. Uh, people put years and years of their lives into building these um, brilliant machines that can go out into space and explore the unknown. And so that was a real heartbreaker. But yet we persevered and came back. And so if you go to the next one, um, you can see my current favorite robot. This is a picture that sits above my desk on the left in my office when I'm normally there. I'm here at my home office now as we all are. But um, this is actually the cover of Science Magazine uh, with, with some scientific results that we got using this beautiful girl, the Curiosity Rover. So this is her selfie. So this is um, from when Curiosity, this is pretty soon after she landed. She landed on my birthday in 2012. It wasn't about me, like she didn't do that on purpose, but it was sort of like an extra bonus that she landed on my birthday. Um, and there she is sitting um, at the foot of this beautiful mountain and the layers in that mountain, it's a picture you can see on the right. It reminds me of the Grand Canyon and the beautiful layers there. But, but in fact, what we're doing with her here, so first of all, this is her selfie. She has a camera on the end of her robotic arm and so she can take selfies just like we all do. And just like us, you can't see our arm when we take the selfie. So you can't see her arm in that picture. But, but we had used her arm to dig those little, those little dark spots in the lower left are um, places where we used her scoop to scoop up soil. And we took that soil and we fed it into a, a machine in the belly of the rover and we heated it up and we analyzed the chemistry. A lot like I used to do back in the labs at Caltech and UCLA. And now we were doing it on the surface of Mars completely awesome and amazing and what we found when we did that was that you know about this much dirt on mars contains about two of these worth of water which is kind of amazing if you think about when when you're going to go to mars and you're going to need water to live off the land you're going to find it because it's right there in the soil right at the surface all right you can get rid of the cool mars slides now though but those are my favorite robots ones that i've been involved in in designing and building and, and using for scientific exploration and then the other thing i did at nasa just to pretty quickly wrap up this part of it is uh my last job there i, I oversaw the future human space flight program so that was about thinking about at that time we were retiring the space shuttle and thinking about getting humans um, beyond low earth orbit you're hearing a lot these days about humans going to the moon about um, Elon Musk's rockets about next week, I think, to launch US astronauts from US soil for the first time since 2011, for the first time since we've retired the space shuttle. That was a program I helped start and oversee while I was at NASA. Thank you so much for sharing that. So um, this session is focused on how to become a roboticist. Um, what should I study in high school if I want to get into the field of robotics? 
Yeah, so great question. Um, so obviously robotics is is a pretty STEM intensive field. And so I would I would for sure recommend STEM courses. That's math and science um, and and you know design programming, things like that, if you have those available to you. But here's the other thing I would say. You know, that robot that I just showed you, that gorgeous robot that's currently driving around on the surface of Mars, was not built by one person. It was not built alone. It was built by a huge team of people with all sorts of different backgrounds. So there's a lot of different pathways to get to do work on cool robots like that. Um, but the other important thing is it's all about teamwork. It's all about people working together and collaborating. It's all about being able to communicate, hey, you know, my system's going to do this. What's your system going to do? And are they going to talk to each other and work together? That's how we avoid problems like the one that crashed is if people collaborate a bit better. Um, and so, you know, thinking about experiences, whether that's inside the classroom or outside the classroom, that will help you with communication and teamwork is also super important. So that's one of the things I love say about FIRST Robotics or VEX Robotics, some of the opportunities for young people to really get involved in robotics work. Yeah, there's cool tech involved in that, but there's also a lot of teamwork and communication. And so those sorts of opportunities are good too. For us at WPI, a lot of our robotics students come in with a bit of that background and experience, something like FIRST or VEX, not all for sure, and, and you can definitely start it at any point in your life, but, but those kind of experiences are what I would recommend. Thank you so much. Um, so you are the president of WPI and have had robotics engineering as a major for over a dozen years. Um, can you tell me about the undergraduate program in robotics at WPI? Yeah, I can. And at first I can say, I know I'm the president because it says so right here on my shirt. See, Whereas, yeah, so that's how I know because sometimes you can forget, you know, this COVID head if, <laughs> these days. Anyway, yes, I would love to tell you about the major of WPI, but before I tell you, I would love to show you. We have a cool video we can share. Got a good beat there. Um, yeah, so our robotics engineering program, Tom mentioned in the opening that it was um, that we were the first in the nation to offer a degree in robotics engineering. And it was a special thing. Three different departments came together to create this degree. It's, it's sort of one part computer science, one part mechanical engineering, and one part electrical and computer engineering. So it really crosses all of these disciplines. And that's the really fun thing about robotics engineering is how multidisciplinary it is that you have to learn um, a bit about a lot of different stuff in order to design and build and create robots that can um, really help people in all sorts of different ways like we saw in the opening video there. 
Uh, so, so that's one thing is it brings together all these different disciplines. The other thing I would say is it's really well suited to WPI in general because our motto is theory and practice, which means you know you learn some things in the classroom, but pretty quick you switch over to building things with your hands and, and using them in the world to make a difference. And so, the, so robotics itself, because it is such a hands-on field, is really well suited to a place like WPI that really cares a lot about hands-on and project-based education. And to that point, like the students in our robotics and engineering classes, they build robots in all the classes. So like one of the challenges we just had in with our all of our classes going remote, and for us, it was just the beginning of a new term because our terms are only seven weeks long. We don't have semesters, we have seven week terms. We have four of them, like kind of like quarters in high school. Um, we were just at the beginning of a new one and all of a sudden everybody was working remotely. So we shipped hundreds of kits of robots to students so they could still build robots, even though they were doing so at home. I heard a lot from parents about how they were like lab assistants for their college students building their robots uh, during this uh, crazy moment that we find ourselves in right now. Thank you. So we have uh, one of the questions from our attendees. Um, mm -hmm. They asked, how do you name your robots? Oh, how do we name the robots? Um, so for Mars, maybe you mean like how do we name it? Curiosity, kids yeah. name them. And actually, the the newest one that's gonna that's gonna launch um, in uh, sometime this summer, I think I should know the date, but I don't. Um, is called Perseverance, and it was named by um, a young person who is in I think middle school or high school, and they had finalists, and there was voting, and one of the finalists was from Massachusetts. Actually, that's not the one that won, but still. Um, yeah, so, and, and we all love the names. I love the name Curiosity. Um, it's just been, it's great to get the public really involved in naming, in naming the missions. That's great. Um, how does robotics relate to health careers? Ah, yeah, well, that's a really good question, especially right at the moment, right? So, um, so there's, there's many ways that robotics can be used with health careers. So everything from, and we have things in our labs at WPI, right? We have Vin, what are called Da Vinci surgical robots. So that's the most common kind of robotic surgery that can be done now is with a robot called a Da Vinci. We're on the cutting edge of, of doing research that's gonna help improve those robots for the future. So here's like one way that that shows up at WPI. The Da Vinci itself is full of metal, which is fine in a normal operating room. But if you have, say, a brain tumor, what they want to do is put you inside an MRI and figure out exactly where the tumor is so that when you do the surgery, you can do it really precisely. So what you'd like to have is a robot that can go inside an MRI machine, which means it can't have any metal in it. So our scientists are working on, our roboticists are working on robots that can do surgery inside an MRI machine, which is just amazing. So you can be taking the pictures while you're just getting, you know, burning up those bad cells. They're working on robots that can, I mean, this, some of this gets a little gross, that can do esophageal, I'm not even saying it right. This is where the I study rocks part comes in. I don't study esophaguses, esophagi? <laughs> anyway uh can do surgery um oral surgery and things like this it's just amazing so there's surgical robots but then there's like a whole other kinds of categories of robots that you can think of for say hospital use and especially right now as we've had you know patients with covid who are highly contagious imagine you know someone's taking a risk every time they walk into the room to deliver a meal to an infectious person so, you know, if we can have robots deliver meals, if we can have, you know, robots take care of some of the disinfecting of the spaces, there are all kinds of opportunities to have robots do the work that's, that's too, like they, they like to say, dirty, dangerous, or dull for humans to do. And, and in this case, you know, really dirty and dangerous healthcare is one of those areas where I think we're gonna see even much more use of robotics in the future. Thank you so much. Um, I have a very interesting question here. So okay. do I have to go to college to be involved in robotics? Yeah, um, so listen, there's there's gonna be robots in all our lives. There probably already are. Many of you probably have that great iRobot thing that goes around your house and you know, there's all kinds of 
ways that we'll all be interacting more and more with robots as um, as time goes on, as they become more and more prevalent in our lives. Um, so you don't have to go to college to interact with robots, but if you want to be someone who really designs and builds robots, it's pretty likely you're gonna you're gonna need to go to college um, because the the kinds of of design work and thinking and programming and such those skills. Um, you know, I would I wouldn't say you know, it's absolutely required, but almost all of the jobs in the robotics industries um, need some college and, and most likely a college degree. Thank you for that. Um, mm -hmm. um, what is there in WPI for middle schoolers? Ah, middle schoolers at WPI, yeah. So, um, a lot, um, although this summer, not as much, unfortunately. But but um, we, we do have many summer camp offerings, including in robotics. Uh, for uh, for middle schoolers and high schoolers as well. So you can definitely look for those. Some of those co courses we've been able to take remote for the summer, um, others maybe not. And so I'm not totally up on exactly what the latest offerings are for this summer, but most summers you will be able to come to our campus and, and get involved with robotics, both with WPI-based camps. And we also run a high school um, called the Massachusetts Academy of Math and Science. And they also run summer camps that include robotics camps. And there are a lot of robotics camps around, actually, not only at WPI. If you're interested in that, I'm almost certain you can always find a place to go, whether that's at the Museum of Science or, or on, a, on your local college campus. Definitely uh, explore that online, and you can see what you can find. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, what are some of the most interesting robots that can be found in the labs at WPI? Well, I told you about the surgical ones already, and that's pretty interesting. Um, you know, I think in that video you saw, and again, uh, like when I was a kid, we played that operation game where you were trying to get the thing out of the person, and now we do it with robots, which is kind of amusing. But, but, but the actual applications are really serious um, for the medical robotics. We also have people working on real, the most advanced robots in the industries, whether that's manufacturing robots, we have those and, and our scientists are working with them to make them better and safer. We have, um, I think the only working Atlas robot at a US university, that's the humanoid robot from um, Boston Dynamics. So our students are working really actively on humanoid robots as well. Um, and then we have a bunch of the ones that we build ourselves, like, um, like the cat, the cat robot that you saw in the video there. Um, we have autonomous sailboats that we build and race in competitions. Um, in fact, we have, um, I, I, I don't know if we're the only university, but I can't imagine there are very many others. In our gym, yeah, we have locker rooms and stuff, but we also have robot pits um, as part of our gym. So like we think robotics competitions are really cool. And so any kind of robotics competition on any given weekend you might find going on on our campus. That's so interesting. Um, one of our attendees asked, um, what are some interesting ways you have seen robotics being used in manufacturing? Yeah. Um, so I, uh, I think there's a lot going on in that space. Has been for a long time, right? That's probably was the earliest kind of industry to really be transformed by robotics. So um, many factories kind of got away from the idea of having a lot of people in them. They just have a lot of robots in them. So the interesting thing that's happening now with manufacturing is the idea is that robots and people can work together. They don't have to be separated by so much, right? So this idea that, that we make the robot so safe that it's perfectly fine for the humans and the robots to be interacting. And that's gonna make more complex manufacturing activities much more possible. And, and that's a, a real subject of, of a lot of research at WPI as well. That's great. Um, uh, another question is, um, what are some of the projects that students have developed that you remember at WPI? Yeah, so because we have so many projects, there's always a lot to choose from. And, and last year, I, at the end of the year, they display all their projects and I walked through the building where they were doing it. And there were a couple that definitely caught my eye. So um, one that I that I love is that autonomous sailboat. So, so that is about um, 
this sailboat competition that they have. And, and it turns out that for years, the students at the Naval Academy in, in Maryland, right, the, like the Navy guys literally won every single year because they're Navy guys. So that kind of makes sense. But a couple of years ago, for the very first time ever, another university beat them and it was us. It was our uh, seafaring robot. So that was great. Um, last year, I really remember this one group that had this very cool autonomous drone that could be used in agriculture. And it was in this whole encased kit that where you could just sort of put it out in a field and it could be controlled from very far away and the kit would open and it would fly around and do it whatever it was it was supposed to do. And then it would come back and redock and close up and just sit there. Like absolutely amazing. And the students themselves built and programmed uh, this drone for that kind of work. And there's so many different applications like that. And that's the beauty, right? One kind of robot could be applied in a lot of different fields. And so there's there's sort of infinite um, cool work to be done. Um, and then I would say the other cool thing is with some of the things that were done not as part of class projects, but just because they're interesting. So we had a team a few years ago that won a challenge from NASA about um, a robot that could scoop up dirt on the moon and the students worked on it for a couple of years and they won half a million dollars, which is kind of amazing. And, and then uh, also we have a lot of teams that compete on uh, battle bots. So uh, Byte Force, which is like the multi-time, all-time champion of, of, uh, of uh, Battle bots is is WPI grad Paul Ventimiglia, who's the nicest guy on the planet. He's fantastic, and uh, and then also we had a team of current students compete on Battle bots this year. For those of you Battle bots fans, if you remember the frog robot ribbit, uh, that was us. <laughs> that was our students. <laughs> so they actually took a term off of school to go out to California and film the season of Battle bots, which was really cool. So cool. So one of our attendees asked if you could talk about the career path for robotics major. Yeah. So, um, well, here's what I would say. One, they all get jobs. They all get jobs. Like it's, it's pretty amazing to see. And they get jobs in all sorts of types of industries because, again, they have this skill set that's highly flexible. They know how to do some programming. They know how to do some mechanical design. They know how to, you know, build circuit boards. They they know how to do um, lots of different things. So they could either choose to specialize in one of those areas, or maybe they can go to companies like like those that you'll hear from later in the series, like iRobot um, or like Amazon Robotics, to uh, to work with them on on either developing new robots or or uh, implementing their current systems and keeping those going. So we've got students going all over the world, um, all over the country, and then also right here, staying as many as I would love this, staying right here in Massachusetts to help support our growing robotics industry. The other thing I would say is um, more and more we're seeing our students wanting to start their own companies. And so we that's certainly a path for students as well to go to some of the either start their own or go to a, a small, fast growth uh, tech company. And then, and then these days we have, in addition to the, our undergraduate, our bachelor's degree program, we have master's and PhD programs. And so some of our students might stay on or come here just as graduate students and do their doctorate and become professors. You can do that as well. You can teach robotics. Um, and so many of them are involved um, on the side in things like FIRST and VEX, helping to mentor young people um, with their passion in robotics. And, and so many of our current students actually get involved in that as well because we have a, a long-standing connection to FIRST because Dean Kamen is a, um, attended WPI and so we have a very strong connection there. That's great, thank That's you great. so much. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm gonna ask the final question here and so, okay. What kind of impact do you think robots will have in the future and where where will they play the biggest role? Yeah, I think this is a, you know, it's dangerous to predict the future, I think, because especially in fields like this that change so fast, I, I'm certain what I'm going to say right now will be wrong, but uh, but it's fascinating to think about. And and this this whole thing about robots doing the dirty, dangerous and dull jobs, I think that's going to remain true. But I think if we look back five to 10 years from now, 
this moment we're actually in, this moment when we're all working much more remotely, when we're staying connected in very different ways, is going to lead to some revolutions in robotics that we can't quite get our heads around yet. The world of work is gonna be fundamentally different after this, and robots are gonna to contribute to making that world feasible and making it fun and good and uh, and you know the idea of telepresence robots robots that can you know be be present for you you can take a tour of a college campus by joysticking a robot around you know there's all kinds of things that you can imagine happening there and i think some of those things are really going to get accelerated because of um, of these last couple of months that we've all been dealing with and I think the expansion of robotics, um, of, of robotic tech systems in healthcare is gonna be accelerated as well. So it's gonna be really, really interesting. And let's let's get back together in 10 years and and uh, and see and see what happens. But Glades and I have one question for you before we finish. Of course. So um, of course we'll give you a scholarship, but you're gonna to come to WPI, right? Yes, of course. <laughs> All right, done. <laughs> I'll be there soon. So All right. Pandemic is over. Excellent. Had to check. Great. Well, well, thank you. Uh, thank you both. Thank you, Dr. Lefshin. Thank you, Gleason. Appreciate uh, your time. Um, we're we're now wrapping up. We, we've we've uh, we've set these up to be about forty five minutes, and we're going to be conscious of that and keep to that time. Um, I wanted to thank you both. I think uh, there were some great questions we didn't get to, so we're going to try to capture those, um, and we uh, will try to get some answers to those. Uh, uh, written up and, and posted on our website. Um, I think this has been, uh, it's been a, a, a challenging time for many of us uh, trying to do these type of events um, through webinars like this and, and other events. Um, I'm excited that the state of Massachusetts is reopening. I want to thank Dr. Leshen. We had the prior away. She, for those of you who don't know, she was involved in the uh, state's reopening uh, committee. And uh, that has been very active for the last couple of weeks. Uh, the governor announced uh, the first of those plans earlier this week. So uh, we're, we're grateful that she could uh, make some time for this. It's, it's been great. Um, I also wanna let you know that uh, we're going to be doing another one of these next Wednesday. Uh, we'll be speaking with Colin Engel. Colin is the uh, founder and CEO of iRobot, the largest consumer robotics company in the world, based right here in, in Massachusetts. So we look forward to having you all join us then. Also, um, if you'd like to learn more about robotics in the state of Massachusetts, um, the uh, Commonwealth has put together a really good website. Um, it is www.masstech.org slash robotics. Um, and that's the website for the Massachusetts Tech uh, Technology Collaborative, which kind of helps manage the state's uh, interest in technology. Um, and so if you go to that site, you're gonna find a lot more information. There's also a lot of links there about uh, some school programs, middle school, high school, different uh, FIRST programs and all sorts of things. Uh, you can find that on that website as well. So I encourage you to go take a look at that. Um, and then and then finally, I just wanna thank the folks at Mass Tech for helping us with these videos and, and putting this together. It's, it's been a, an, a fun experience. Um, and I look forward to seeing you all on the next uh, panel. Thank you very much. A robot is an extension of human capability. It feels like the future. It's very exciting. You will see everything from drones to self-driving vehicles, walking robots, and we're excited that it's being developed here in Massachusetts. We have the breadth of talent, the investor community. We have the facilities to design it, fabricate it, test. It's just a great environment for robotics.